great privilege of meeting Dr. Steitiao Fasol from Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. He is working primarily with the Institute of Geography and Statistics for the Brazilian government, but he is also vice president of the International Geographical Union. He's here to tell us about the plans for next year's IGO Congress in Brazil. So I have cornered him for a moment to speak a little bit about his own research interests, which are close to mine, urban and regional development. He will tell us specifically about the dream and reality of development planning uh, with a focus on the 70s, hopefully. But first, I would like you to tell us a little bit about your own personal background, your, where you come from, and where your interest in geography and regional development have sprung. Can you just... Yes, thank you. Uh, it's a great opportunity for me to be here and to talk with you and to so many other people that would listen to this uh, program. Uh, I am uh, a Brazilian geographer. I was born in the state of Minas Gerais, uh, which is a central state, uh, central western state. Uh, my father was a farmer. At, uh, I was born in a small, small village. So since my childhood, I learned to observe the landscape, to, to appreciate the landscape and, and have a feeling for uh, how it looks like, uh, what are the difference between one place and another. So I suppose uh, a uh, born interest in geography came in from, from, this, uh, from this background. And it's interesting to see that even though now I am a uh, urban regional geographer working and interested in the problems of the growth of towns and the planning of development of these towns, uh, this rural back background led me to have my PhD program in, the, in, the, in my dissertation <coughs> on rural development in Brazil. Mm -hmm. So it was since uh, my, my, my PhD, which was here in the United States in Syracuse, that uh, sometime after that, that I turned into an uh, urban and regional program. So uh, that rural background, I think, led me to rural problems in Brazil, uh, in, especially in my, in my own area, in central, in central western Brazil. Uh, of course, being from a small town in the interior of Brazil, to have my uh, college courses, uh, I moved uh, into Rio uh, to go to the university. And of course, uh, my, my, my interest at that, time, uh, at that time was, you know, just to get a degree in geography and see whether I would either teach geography or go into research. Uh, to help uh, my going into school, I became a, uh, a part-time worker in the Brazilian Institute of Geography and Statistics, which did that for a number of students to help them get through the university, but not, all, not, all, not only to get through the university, but uh, also to, to start some, some uh, training while studying. Uh, in, in, in practical <coughs> problems, in, uh, uh, in theoretical problems, in living with uh, geographical problems of any kind. Uh, and of course, after three years in university and in that institute, I had finished my, my undergraduate course and became an employee of that, uh, mm -hmm. of that institute. Which years would this have been? This was... Uh, 1941, 42, mm -hmm. uh, and by 1944, I, I was already a graduate from the university, <coughs> mm -hmm. employee of the of this institute. Uh, of course, this institute it's a uh, it's a unique to some extent a unique organization uh, in the sense that it is <coughs> a part of the Ministry of Planning. Uh, but it does has a extensive uh, research and development uh, program and a group 
and it's quite interdisciplinary in the sense that it has geography and demography and uh, ec economists and, and sociology and anthropologists uh, and so on uh, in, in that research and development group. The purpose of this uh, research and development group it's not only to produce uh, research and studies uh, for the Ministry of Planning, but also to feed back uh, the, the statistical agency. Uh, this institute is also the Central Statistical Agency of Brazil. Uh, so the research and development group feeds back, uh, and it's feeded by this, by this uh, data that we collect, and it feeds back the, the people that organize the questionnaires and so on. So re research we do points out some of the critical problems uh, for which we need more data to understand it better. So that's what I call a unique uh, system, which is not very common in, in, in most places. Uh, so I begin that work on, on research geography associated with other, other social sciences uh, in Brazil, in this institute, up to 1952. Mm -hmm. At that time, Professor Preston James uh -huh. uh, from Syracuse University was in Brazil, mm -hmm. uh, and I worked with him in Brazil at that time, just the year before. And uh, he suggested and he actually offered uh, a fellowship for me to come to Syracuse uh, to complete my graduate work, which I did uh, for about three years working with him in Syracuse. Mm -hmm. uh, and finally I got my PhD in Syracuse. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I mentioned before, at that time, uh, my, my dissertation was on the problems of uh, uh, agriculture development of the Central Plateau in Brazil. Uh, it was that because at that time uh, we were engaged in, in this institute I just mentioned, we were engaged in uh, extensive surveys, analysis and studies uh, for the location of the new capital of Brazil. Yes, uh, that's one of the most <laughs> renowned mm -hmm. dream and reality projects. Yes, as a matter of fact the dream of the new capital began with the, uh, with the positivists uh -huh. that were basically responsible for the, at least for the intellectually conceived part of the proclaiming the republic in Brazil. Mm -hmm. And their dream at that time was that if the capital of Brazil, instead of being in Rio de Janeiro, would be located on the center of the country. Uh, and I almost quote, they said, the water from the rivers, as the ideas would flow from that center of the country into all directions, because their idea of that center was not exactly the geometrical center of the country, but some place in which most of the river, of the river basins uh, would sort of uh, start from that mm -hmm. point. So the idea was that the, the geometric uh, uh, position uh, would also be relevant to the political idea of having a capital, uh, ideas and facts and laws and so on, uh, dispersing uh, from that uh, main center like the waters on the river, which is... Uh, which is uh, a dream, uh, <laughs> at least. Well, something Foucault has some comments on. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. So the work uh, for this already began in the 50s then? Yes. yes. Then, then from that time, of course, the idea was left, uh, you know, without any consequences, uh, up, to, up to the end of the 40s, uh, when it was decided to some extent that the, uh, a new site for the capital would be, located, would, be, would be selected and a new position for the capital would be selected. Now, of course, ideas in geography at that time had 
at least if in Brazil, had evolved from the idea of a center in terms of the geometric center, but uh, toward the idea of a core of mm -hmm. the country. Uh, a core with, with, a, with I mean, a concept of a, a more uh, political and economic core rather than simply the geometric center. Mm -hmm. So since at that time, Sao Paulo state and the southern part of Brazil was already the uh, most developed part of the country and uh, most of the economic power mm -hmm. was already located in the, in the southeast area, which include also, of course, Rio de Janeiro. Uh, rather than being too far to the northwest in the direction of the wild frontier or yes. something, mm -hmm. uh, it should be projected into this area, but it should be located within the core, mm -hmm. uh, or at least in the margin of that core. Mm -hmm. So these were the basic ideas uh, orienting, orienting people that were studying and trying to produce a report mm -hmm. that uh, could uh, lead to a decision into where to place the capital. Mm -hmm. And my dissertation was, was connected with that problem because even though that center, that margin of the core was uh, near the central area, that central area was in Brazil was basically savanna type of vegetation and soils. Mm -hmm. And it's known that these soils are poor. So the supply, the food supply, or the agricultural in general mm -hmm. supply area for this new capital should be located and should be studied in their capacity, in its capacity to really supply mm -hmm. things for that. And my dissertation then was associated with the idea of understanding in this part of the central plateau of Brazil where we would have soils, topography, uh, local conditions in general, climate, and so on, yeah. uh, to, to serve as the basic uh, uh, food, source. Food, 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 food supply area for mm -hmm. the new capital. And so I was, uh, I was uh, in charge, well, one of the persons in charge of the problem of studying one of the areas. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's interesting now, I think, to, to mention that at that time, we had, we had uh, a German geographer uh, in Brazil, Professor Leo Weibel. At, or in the 50s? Yes, in the end of the 40s and the beginning of the 50s. Uh -huh. And uh, he just, he was, <coughs> he came from, from the United States, I think he was in Minnesota. Minnesota, yes. And uh, he came to Brazil to begin to study uh, uh, well, basically to begin to study the problem of German colonization in the south of Brazil. Yes. But since he was a Fontinen uh, ah, man, yes. uh, he had written several papers uh, on that, uh, he was also interested in to see how the different areas in Brazil, how the Fontinen pattern could be observed and in what way he could help uh, in the in the programming new developments in agriculture. And uh, uh, I was, again, one of the persons that was working with him for some time mm -hmm. uh, in that project. And it was interesting because he said at the time that he wanted to begin into the backlands mm -hmm. because he wanted to see uh, on one side the vegetation uh, as natural as possible without much of human intervention. And since he had a long experience in Africa, mm -hmm. uh, he wanted to see the savanna type of vegetation and see in what way that savanna type could be utilized in something different than the simple extensive grazing that was always used before. Mm -hmm. So we began some field work in, 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 in that area, which was not far from the area that most people would thought that the new capital would be located. Mm -hmm. So I began that agriculture study with Professor Weibel at that time in this area mm -hmm. uh, that 
it would serve as the basic food supply area for the new capital. So when I came to the United States, I had that study nearly completed. So my, my PhD program in the United States was quite curious. The first thing I had done was a dissertation. Uh -huh. <laughs> then I began to take the courses and the, and the final program. So it's, uh, if one uh, look at my, my, my courses and my program in, United, in, in Syracuse at that time, uh, three months after my, my, my oral examination, I had my dissertation written. Uh, yeah. So it was a quite yes. uh, unusual. Well, unusual. you know, Preston James himself has said that the reason he preferred to go to Clark rather than Chicago in the early 20s mm -hmm. was that at Clark he could write his own program. Yes. So he obviously believed in letting people write their own yes. <laughs> graduate program. Of yes. course, yes. Uh, I, I owe much of my uh, experience to these two persons, but uh, in the United States, Professor Preston James, who became, I think I could call him my intellectual father of some kind uh -huh. uh, because after that I, I mean after the, the the PhD program we worked for a long time together in corresponding and mm -hmm. exchanging experience and so on mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so uh, uh, mm -hmm. and of course his experience in Latin America his view of the problems mm -hmm. uh, of Brazil to some extent and to many you know, of many other countries mm -hmm. uh, in Latin America as well I think it helped to strengthen my 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 graduate my graduate training and my my uh, understanding of the problems uh, a lot and, and helped me in many in many many other uh, yes, situations. One was very curious about such things. Would would now Professor James' textbook on Latin America be used widely in Latin America or not? Well, uh, the problem in Latin America is that. Uh, Students uh, uh, would, would would not speak English uh, very very commonly, mm. since his book has not been translated into Spanish. It's somewhat difficult to use uh, his books, yes. and his book is also, I think, uh, better for upper level of, of of undergraduate and probably for for some of the graduate courses as well. Yes. And you know. Uh, and now in Latin America, you don't have so many graduate courses as you as you understand them in the United States. In some cases, you have master's programs, but mm -hmm. the PhD programs there are not very many. In, in, mm -hmm. Even in Brazil, mm -hmm. you have one PhD program in Sao Paulo State for geography. Mm -hmm. In Rio itself, you have a master's program, and you don't have a PhD program. Mm -hmm. So that uh, that uh, uh, type of book sometimes it's more useful yes. if we had if we had some graduate program but your whole background in brazil has been strongly influenced from france right french geographers uh, in brazil yes uh, at least up to world war one uh -huh. uh, world war II, two i'm sorry yes. uh, but after world war ii uh, quite a number of brazilian students and geographers uh, were turning to uh, non-france western europe uh -huh. uh, into the United States. Uh, even though I had in my undergraduate program many French uh, geographers, professors, uh -huh. like Professor Pierre Monbeg or Professor Rouelin or many others, uh -huh. uh, yes. they had great influence in, in, in uh, forming Brazilian geographers uh, before that time. Mm. Uh, I had come to the United States for a, for a PhD program and, and some other my colleagues uh, uh, were also. Mm. I think two of our doctors in Brazil were from Louisiana State. Uh, oh, really? Uh, yeah. uh -huh. so, uh, yes. so this cultural landscape tradition is also kept alive in yes. Brazilian geography? Yes, it was, was, was yes. kept alive uh, quite, uh, quite strongly as a matter of fact. Yes. Now, <clears throat> then, after I came back from the States, and this was already 1956 and 1957, the, the, the selection of the new capital was already uh, decided, and the problem was then to, to really begin the planning of the new town. Uh, and of course, even though uh, 
the selection of the position of the new capital, geographers had a very important role to play uh, in the planning of the town itself. The, we, we had basically architects, and I think it's, it's well known that the overall plan was, uh, was, was done by Lucio Costa, and most of the intra-city intra, uh, uh, planning was done by, by, I forgot his name. Uh, was it was it a, a Frenchman? No. No. I well, well I, I will that. remember the name in in in, in a minute. But uh, he he also planned the building of the of the United Nations. It's, it's a well uh, it's a well known uh, Brazilian we architect. We both bow our heads in shame for having forgotten <laughs> yes, well right. such happens. But do you do the Nehemiah? Inter- yes, Nehemiah. Yes. Oscar okay. Nehemiah. Yes. All right. But did he? Did the internal plan reflect that general ideology of a core, or was it? No, because because Oscar Niemeyer was a uh, materialist, mm-hmm. uh, Marxist uh, mm-hmm. thinker, mm-hmm. and uh, so his whole his whole planning of the town. Uh, reflected the idea of small communities within the town, mm-hmm. somewhat self, uh, self-sufficient self mm-hmm. in terms of uh, local things and schools and so on. Uh, but uh, one, of the, one of the most uh, curious things about that, and, and that's why I mentioned he was Marxist, uh, he is Marxist, mm-hmm is that his major accomplishment in terms of the architectural uh, Mm -hmm. organization of the town was the Catholic Church, (laughs) which is uh, difficult to understand that uh, someone of that uh, line. And, uh, well, the the picture is is a well-known picture of the cathedral in in, in Brazil is well-known, and it symbolized someone on his knees uh, because it has a shape uh, uh-huh. like that, someone on his knees. And it's interesting to note that you have sort of a tunnel before entering uh, the, the, the church itself. Mm-hmm. And his own explanation for that uh, is that the tunnel is somewhat dark and religion is the light after you had passed the dark. Uh, and this mm-hmm. for a convicted Marxist is, is something that it's, it's, it's difficult to understand. Oh, I, I think most creative thinkers yeah. know where things they have fit. no, 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 no. No, they recognize where, but it sounds a bit more anarchist than Marxist, yeah. this idea of having cohesive communities. Mm-hmm. But was it adequately planned for economic development or was it simply going to well, be a kind of residence for the government? No, it was, it was basically thought as a, mm-hmm. as a, uh, 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 as a governmental uh, mm-hmm. a place for the for the workers for the government and so on, but of course he has to have the all the services and so on. It wasn't thought to, to be of any industrial development mm-hmm. in this area, but all of the other service at the level mm-hmm. of a, of needed by by a capital city of a country of the size of Brazil with now 120 million people. Uh, mm-hmm. But this was the dream. They thought that the new capital would grow up to 500,000 people in the year of 2000. Mm -hmm. That is, in 40 years, it would grow from nothing to half a million people. Now, we are in 1980, and the census that was done in Brazil in in September 1970 showed that Brazil had 1.3 million people at that time. So uh, they had passed the, the 500,000 mark by far uh, 20 years before uh, the, 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 the time limit that they thought that they would, they would get. How does one explain it? Is it migration, attraction well, of the capital, or well, has it really been yes, economic? You have, you have to think the effect that the capital city has on people. Uh-huh. People would tend to go to the capital city because, well, uh, it's near the government, uh, a lot of things in there, people would tend to go there. And plus the fact that, uh, well, to serve as the capital city, uh, 
one needed to build roads into it. Mm -hmm. And of course, roads uh, from, from Brasilia to north up to Belém, where is the, mm -hmm. the mouth of the Amazon, to the south, to Sao Paulo, to the northeast, uh, into the southwest, into the uh, Bolivian and Paraguayan border. Now, these roads, of course, uh, serve to increase the accessibility of Brasilia for mm -hmm. many things. For generators. Including, including for migrants. Uh -huh. yes. uh, and of course, uh, this, since the dream was reflected in the reality of the size of the town as planned, yes. the, the town was planned to hold 500,000 people in, in 20 years, in 30 years. Uh, and the physical setting of that town uh, in 1980 uh, wouldn't stand, wouldn't support this 1.3 million. So where did they go? They, they had gone to the vicinity, to the surroundings of the, of the town itself. And of course there you had just bare land. You had no planted town like Brasilia with the, no traffic signs, for instance, and, and you know, a lot of... Uh, uh, modern, so-called modern uh, means of crossing underneath or on yeah. top and so on to mm -hmm. make traffic very easy. So since they it didn't resist that so many people migrating into that, they had to build without any, any, any planning, just mm -hmm. begin to build a, a street and houses on both sides and so on. Uh, so now you have a number of uh, 100,000 100, people, towns, uh, in the surroundings, three or four of them in, in the surroundings of Brasilia, uh, which changed the whole yes. picture of, of the organization of the town itself. Now, you, I mean, it had followed the pattern traditionally in, in many other places in Brazil. Someone would uh, buy some land and oh, Yes. divided into right. pieces, build some streets and so on, and there you yeah. have people moving into it. So it followed the old traditional uh, pattern of, of establishing new towns in, right. in Brazil. So you have the well-planned Brasilia core, core and, and then the, the... The pot that boiled out. <laughs> boiled out yes. and, and spilled, spilled over into the, into the surroundings. Is the government deliberately trying to contain that in any way or mop it well, up? Uh, during the during the 60s and the 70s, a lot of studies on, on, on migration behavior were conducted in Brazil to see, I mean, how, how it worked. Uh, they deliberately uh, tried not to offer uh, special conditions for for industries or for any economic activity to be located in Brasilia, but people began to move mm -hmm. and, and there was nothing you can do because you can't, you can't prohibit some, someone to move to, to, to anywhere in, in the country. Mm -hmm. I mean, it would be impossible to control. Mm -hmm. uh, and once they, they, they moved, they migrated into Brasilia, the emergency of services and commerce and supermarkets and mm -hmm. all kinds and schools and hospitals and everything, mm -hmm. you know, for servicing that population would be unavoidable as well. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, uh, right now I think the position that everybody takes in relation to that problem is let it go. There's nothing we can do about, so uh, let it go. But there are other, it's not the only part of Brazil where population is increasing at this rate and urbanizing no, itself. No. Um, <clears throat> but in other areas, you can explain it more, I suppose, in terms yes. of economic uh, incentive. Mm -hmm. But here, it's simply the, the attraction of the capital, it seems. Yes, it is the attraction. Well, and it's the attraction of the interior. Uh -huh. A lot of the dispute and the arguments about Brasilia was that we had about 90% of the Brazilian population in a 400 kilometers belt from the coast. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of people said that, well, if we are ever to be uh, a big country in addition to being a large country, mm -hmm. uh, we have to move more into the interior. We have to occupy the, the, the 
the remote uh, areas of the country, we have to transform the political boundaries into economic boundaries as well. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's the dream, again. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, in some places, that dream has been transformed into reality. But in most of the Brazilian frontier, except for the Argentina border, and a little bit here and there, most of the frontier is, uh, is an empty frontier with, with places mm -hmm. along the frontier, but uh, mm -hmm. not with a, not with a mm -hmm. uh, overall occupancy of, of the territory. What, what do you draw from that? Are you, are, the, what the story, as you've told it, suggests to me that decentralization inland will work if political power goes with it, but not otherwise. Is that too yes, wild? Yes, but it didn't quite work because, mm -hmm. well, if, if we look what happened in these areas, you have Brasilia with uh, almost one and a half million. You have uh, a new state that was created in the Bolivian border toward the northwest, mm -hmm. uh, which is the state of Rondonia. Mm -hmm. They found minerals there and the forest, the soils of the forest was very good. So we have a very strong migration into, into this area. Mm -hmm. So much that, for instance, that area as a federal territory, had about 50,000 people in 1960. Uh, it grew to 150 in 1970 and to half a million in 1980. Wow. So it was a tremendous uh, population growth during <clears throat> these 20 years in which they had moved into there because of yeah. good land, of uh, some uh, minerals they found in there. So it was uh, quite an extensive. But most of the, the rest of the area, except for that part mm -hmm. of Rondonia, uh, was, was, was left with uh, uh, one inhabitant for yes. 50 or 100 mm -hmm. square kilometers. So it was mm -hmm. it's really empty land. Mm -hmm. But even there, it's a small number of people. Now, if you take Sao Paulo, for instance, mm -hmm. the, the large metropolitan area in Sao Paulo, uh, which in 1970 had about 8 million people, mm -hmm. in 1980 has about 12 million. So it's a 50% increase for the metropolitan area as a whole. But you take small uh, or medium-sized towns in the interior of that area. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them have doubled, some of them had tripled population in the, in, in the 10 years. Mm -hmm. So that overall growth of mm -hmm. the metropolitan area follows the same traditional pattern in most large metropolitan areas of the world in which the population of the main town it's not growing very rapidly anymore because the densities are very high and population is sort of spilling over yes. into the surroundings, into the mm -hmm. uh, uh, area around that yeah. major, major center. And, and they're growing very rapidly. Yeah. So four million people had moved and born uh, in, in Sao Paulo metropolitan area uh, in the last 10 years. Now, I'm, I'm mentioning this because in the late 60s, 67, 68, we were conscious that the eight or nine large metropolitan centers in Brazil were overgrowing. Mm -hmm. uh, and then something had to be done to control the growth, or at least to systematize the growth of these uh, main uh, centers and to create a policy that would divert migration toward these major centers into some orders of smaller size. Uh, mm -hmm. It was a policy called in Brazil middle-sized towns mm -hmm. uh, policy. Uh, we thought that if some incentives, some planning toward these centers mm -hmm. would, 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 uh, would work, uh, the growth of these metropolitan centers would be at least uh, slowed down a yes. bit, and these orders would, would, would grow mm -hmm. a little more. Uh, and what happened uh, in the 70s was that these uh, small size, uh, these medium sized centers, they had grown a lot. Mm -hmm. But the metropolitan centers had grown even more. <laughs> and uh, 
and this was was, was decreasing population in the smaller size centers. In 1980, for instance, uh, you have three, we have in Brazil as a whole, 4,000 counties. Mm -hmm. Now, 300 of them are concentrating half of the Brazilian population. Mm -hmm. And they are basically these medium-sized urban agglomerations and the large metropolitan areas. Uh, And the other 3,700 counties have, uh, they have the the other half of the population, which is a tremendous concentration of people Mm -hmm. into a uh, small number of places. Mm -hmm. Now, more than that, uh, for instance, in the Sao Paulo metropolitan area, we had in 1970 about 39% of the industrial output. Mm-hmm. That's probably more concentration than you have uh, uh, anywhere in the world in terms of the total uh, industrial output for a small area. It's mm-hmm. not for a large area like the northeast of the United States or, mm-hmm. or, or something like that. Uh, and a, again, associated with that urban policy of uh, trying to deconcentrate population, it was a, 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 a industrial decentralization policy as well. In the secondary manufacturing? Secondary manufacturing. Okay. Yeah. And uh, some of the basic things were offered uh, for them was that uh, if they would sell the land and the property they had in the large metropolitan area, Mm -hmm. they will make, naturally, a substantial profit in selling the property. Mm -hmm. And of course, naturally, this this profit would be taxed. Mm -hmm. Now, if one would use that money to reinvest in a new plant, outside of the metropolitan area, Mm -hmm. to modernize the the plant and to reinvest outside of the metropolitan area, they will not pay taxes. Uh So this is is a very strong incentive to to let them move, but Mm -hmm. apparently not enough because uh, Mm -hmm. in 1980 you had 42% of the industrial output uh, in the Sao Paulo metropolitan area. It was not a large increase from 39 to 42, but even though it was thought to be a decrease, and we ended up by having another increase in the, in the total output. So the concentration of, 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 of wealth mm. and of people uh, is, is it's very, very large. It's, it's a great concentration in, in Sao Paulo. And to some extent, that is true for Rio as well. That is true for some of the other metropolitan in Rio Grande do Sul or on the northeast or even in the, in the Belém, which is in the mouth of the Amazon. Belém had grown from 600,000 uh, population in, uh, in 1970 to a little over a million in 1980. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So there again, you have people uh, moving. Mm. Uh, into Berlin from from the interior of the region. Mm. <clears throat> and what is happening in the interior of, the, of these regions? Uh, of course, migration proceeds in a stepwise mechanism. Mm-hmm. And of course, uh, one end of the stepwise pr- uh, process is, is the metropolitan area. The other end is the rural areas. Mm -hmm. And for the first time in Brazil, the rural population had decreased in absolute numbers from 1907 to 1980. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that, well, part of the dream was that the, in the rural areas, we should have some means of uh, keeping the population in the rural Mm -hmm. uh, to maintain the level of production that was uh, established Mm -hmm. at one time Mm -hmm. and to even increase that production Mm -hmm. through modernization of the agriculture. So modernization of the agriculture was thought to be not one process uh, to decrease the population, but it was just to increase production, Uh agricultural production. Mm -hmm. But it turned out to be just uh, decreasing Mm -hmm. the population because 
people who mm-hmm. tend to move to lower size, small size, from small size mm-hmm. to medium mm-hmm. size, and from medium size mm-hmm. to the large metropolitan centers. And they are all growing mm-hmm. uh, on a 50% a year basis, on a 3.3 yearly basis, while Brazil as a whole was growing 2.4 uh, a year. So with these two figures, you can see that the disparities, the, the disparities in growth. Yes. And of course, the disparities in growth in, in the economic side was even higher yes. uh, than that. Yes. Yes. Well, it seems you have at a macro scale the big problems that most countries have experienced, different micro scales in the post-war period. As the last question, I'd like to ask you if you have any possible dreams for the future now that we have learned so much since the 50s, using what I would consider to be fairly conventional geographic certainties about what is rational in the organization of the landscape. Maybe we've been uh, uh, misguided by picking out models that may work for Central Europe and trying them out in Brasilia and so on. Uh, What are the kinds of, just very briefly, what are the kinds of alternatives you're playing with? Well, of course, uh, we have to look at uh, this thing in, uh, with, with, with two views, a short, short-run view, uh, which is very important as well. Uh, we are in a, in a recession period. Uh, we were since 19, we began in 1980, has been going through 81, 82, and it probably will go in 83 as well. So when, when you are in a situation like that, it's, it's somewhat more difficult to think in long terms because yes. the present problems are so pressing yes. that the long-term uh, projections are somewhat left. And this is happening in Brazilian planning. Mm-hmm. Uh, 80% of Brazilian planners are thinking and working for next year's problems. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, and you have left only, I don't know, maybe 10 or 20% of them mm-hmm. thinking for the next decade. Mm-hmm. But are they attacking the spatial, like they did in the past, or are they thinking more structurally? These 20% are thinking both on the structural and the space. The, the 80% are, th- are thinking on the conjun- conjunctural situation of next year. Mm-hmm. Because uh, at, at this time, with all crises and so on, the, mm-hmm. in times of recession, and it has been true in Brazil uh, in, most, in most occasions, the first policy to, to be left aside is the regional imbalance policy. Yeah. Uh, the next one would be the urban policy, uh, uh, and, and then others uh, w- would follow as well. So in the last three years, regional imbalance and, uh, and uh, well, regional imbalance because uh, Equity has been the basic issue in, in urban, in, in regional uh, mm-hmm. policy in Brazil. And now we are more concerned with the efficiency of the economy as a whole than with any problems of equity. Uh, so you're stuck regardless with- of the critical problems in terms of social conditions that this uh, abandonment of the equity mm. think uh, may, may result, mm. even in the short term. Mm. But efficiency is so much more important Urgent. in one or two years yes. that people would take the risk of, of uh, deteriorating social conditions to, to, to maintain the, the efficiency, <laughs> yes, yes. to pay debts, yes, yes. Uh, in, in a way. Well, the picture you are painting is just so complex and yes. it seems so urgent. Uh, I'm sure there's nobody who will have looked at this without appreciating the immensity of the task you face. Uh, I hope that somehow countries can learn a little bit from each other's experiences. Mm-hmm. If we look like you have uh-huh. on what was the dream and what was the reality. I want to thank you. I'm sorry the time has been so short. But I want to thank you ever so much for sharing what you have with us. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Yes. I thank you. Yeah.